This is what I love about being a property investor. It's so simple. You uh, simply just choose some of the best locations and hold on for the ride because we are going to add another third of, uh, well, we're going to increase our dwellings by another 33% to what we currently have. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show is a doozy. Yes, we're going to dig into the intergenerational report and stargaze into the future when it comes to some of the big transformation changes. Things like build to rent in Australia. Is Australia's society being split in two, the have and the have nots? What does real estate actually look like into the future? Does cryptocurrency have anything to do with the Australian property market? We're going to talk about some of these ideas around transformation and future intergenerational reports and really dig into some of the finer details of where society is a bit messed up, but also where the opportunity lies for us property investors to think about the future of Australian real estate. Hey, welcome aboard if it's your first time joining in. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. We're a mad bunch here. We love talking about property. We love talking about urbanity. We often talk about ICs and Gopniks. We cover it all on this program. Hey, I'm going to do a shout out. I'm going to shout out to Nick and Mina. Yes, I have a fan Uh, An older Greek gentleman by the name of Nick sent me some lovely biscuits. Yes, I've received uh, some beautiful little Greek biscuits. I want to shout out to Mina for baking them, Uh, Nick for inspiring the baking, and of course uh, Penny, who's a a good, uh, solid listener of the Urban Property Investor Thank you guys for uh, reaching out to me and and giving me such a lovely gift. Uh, I am going to get fat as a little sausage eating all those biscuits. I think there must be at least 450 biscuits in the bucket. Uh, I received a bucket of biscuits, not, uh, you know, seven biscuits. I received like 700 biscuits, um, which is amazing. Uh, I've never had 700 Greek biscuits, but now I do, so I'm I am stoked. I am eating them uh, five biscuits per day at a time, so I should be done by 2022. I think I'll be finished. So thank you very much, guys. Um, it is yeah the first first interface I've had with the outside world of podcasts and biscuits. So thank you very much. Uh, sometimes people leave reviews. Uh, I prefer biscuits. So uh, if you've left a review, thank you very much for your reviews on the show. And also, obviously, if you're not leaving reviews and sending me biscuits in the mail, that is even even better. So uh, thank you very much, guys. It was really um, well received and uh, you've made a little happy family here. And and uh, certainly for myself, I'm uh, pretty pumped. Hey, we're not here to talk about Uh, Greek men sending me biscuits. We're here to talk about the intergenerational report. We're here to talk about uh, what potentially is going to disrupt real estate into the future through things like build to rent. So I've got a lot to cover. I want to uh, dig into this mad show. It's going to bounce around today, this show. If you've not listened to the Urban Property Investor before, I always recommend listening to the show in... Double speed, yeah. Get your life back, man. Why do you want to listen to someone in normal speed? Speed me up. I'm not a chimp monk. Uh, get your life back. Listen to some alternative podcasts. Sh- uh, you know, think about real estate by learning off some of the great people out there in the industry. All right, so I've got the intergenerational report in my hot little hand. I'm going to uh, flag a few things which are uh, interesting 
in the report. And for me, there's a couple of things that absolutely stand out when it comes to, uh, yeah, what the future looks like. So the first one is um, not a big, uh, you know, left field blow. Uh, what it fundamentally says is where Australia is still going to rely heavily on migration to succeed. Um, Australia is addicted to this thing called migration economics. Now, if you don't know what migration economics is, migration economics is just the principle that you can grow your economy in a few different ways. There's four real ways you can grow your economy. First way is to sell resources. We've got a lot of iron ore here. Uh, Second way is to increase productivity. Third way is to innovate. And the fourth way is to increase your population. If you increase your population, uh, generally speaking, you're sort of increasing your revenue because you've just got more uh, manpower, uh, so to speak, to to increase your GDP. So migration um, is going to continue and Australia is on track by mid-century to reach 40-odd million people and places like Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane are just going to be really, really big places. It's as simple as that. Um, sorry, I'm smashing a coffee while I'm doing this. I don't know. I've never done that before. I've never smashed a coffee while being on air. Um, People of working age for every person age 65 or over. So what the problem is, okay, let me explain the problem. Right now, for everyone over the age of 65, there are basically four people that go to work. So we are collecting a lot of tax uh, from those workers to pay for older people. Into the future, there will only be 2.4 people for every person over the age of 65. Basically, we're almost halving the amount of workforce. So Australians are going to grow old. And, uh, you know, if you're alive today listening to this uh, in 2061, you could be, you know, one of these statistics that there is not going to be a layer of people underneath you to pay the taxes for your retirement. That's what I'm seeing here. Today, uh, right now, there's four people for every one over the age of 65. So there's plenty of taxpayers at work at the moment helping prop up the pension system. In 2061, that's going to half. There's going to be half the level of workers in society propping up old people. So what can we deduce from that? Well, my deduction is you need to absolutely become a self-funded retiree. And I certainly believe in the conspiracy theory that the pension system started in 1991 in Australia. um, And obviously for many of the boomers who are alive today, um, they didn't put aside superannuation. So uh, for them, you know, they never had a full lifespan of parking dough in super. They had kind of like a three-quarter working career of parking dough in super. Millennials, though, today uh, get to park a lot of money in super. So it's kind of like no excuses that they can't self-fund their retirement, right? So this is interesting. This is critical stuff, if you ask me. All released by government, by the way. Um, Obviously, we need a workforce which is highly skilled. The report attributes the idea that it is especially critical to build a skilled workforce. This is something I talk about a lot, right? The skilled economy, the smart economy. This, again, to me, is where we're going to need a lot of extra um, extra future employment, and that is why I'm so interested in real estate in the smarter suburbs where people are ranked more intelligent than others because those more intelligent people with skills are going to be transitioning into higher wages, and because they're tra- transitioning into higher wages – that usually has a correlation in property growth. Hey, uh, other big things I think which are really interesting when it comes to the intergenerational report. So we're going to need another 
Uh, 1.7 million more dwellings in, for example, New South Wales alone. And it's fairly similar across other cities. That's a lot of real estate. And when you think about the price of real estate today in Sydney being uh, fairly well the second most expensive city on planet Earth, what actually happens to the extra 1.7 million more pieces of real estate that are needed to populate society. How expensive will real estate become? Will real estate change direction? Will government need to rethink things like stamp duty to help people get into the market? After all, stamp duty for many people is a uh, barrier to entry to the real estate market because you are having to save for a bloody long time and then you've got to save your tax, your stamp duty for many more years after that. So we are are going to need um, a lot of real estate. That's uh, basically we're going to need in by mid-century or 2060 a, a one new property for every two properties that exist. So think about that. One third more real estate coming into the marketplace. How valuable is really good real estate in really good locations right now? This is what I love about being a property investor. It's so simple. You uh, simply just choose some of the best locations and hold on for the ride because we are going to add another third of Uh, well, we're going to increase our dwellings by another 33% to what we currently have. So again, how valuable is that quiet little, you know, bushland street or that area close to the beach or that live, work, play, lifestyle marketplace? This is what I, I I'm, I'm loving this report. This report's revealing everything. This report is revealing I'm on the right track when it comes to uh, investing, absolutely. So uh, into the future, it uh, it does explain that our household uh, persons per household is going to continue to decline. So people are going to continue to have less uh, larger families. So we're kind of shrinking when it comes to the amount of people per household. Currently, it's 2.5. Uh, and we're going to just shrink slightly below that into the future, which is pretty exciting as well. Uh, When it comes to spending, where is the money going to be spent into the future? Well, sorry, that's me having the coffee. I shouldn't have had the coffee while we were uh, on air. Look, I'm just going to drink the coffee. Hang on a minute. All right, coffee done. We don't have the coffee. Over the next 40 years, there's going to be obviously increased spending and funding and uh, the implications for that really stem and flow into pie, population, infrastructure and employment, right? So when you increase spending in certain programs, you then have to create infrastructure for those programs. You might even need things like better roads, better Uh, train lines for that infrastructure. So the big one really is going to be healthcare. As we can see, Australia is going to become a much older population. It's going to rise uh, accordingly over the next 40 years. And uh, as such, healthcare is going to be the big spend. So this kind of correlates to, again, what I love looking at because right now, um, you know, uh, uh, in regards to overall spending, we're at about 29% of, uh, of, of revenue by government into healthcare. It's going to rise to about 38%. And again, this is why I think, uh, again, knowledge economies, uh, I look at real estate a lot about around hospitals. Hospital belt real estate to me is really, really incredibly important for property investors. I think the spend around hospitals is just going to drive up the demand to live close to hospitals, particularly for those skilled workers. 
uh, the strong education system you quite, quite often find around hospitals, again, is just uh, better utilising really some of the existing infrastructure we have and, of course, creating some opportunities for revenue growth for property investors, which I think is exciting. I think that's, uh, that's where we want to be. Um, when it comes to property investors, if we can't buy the, you know, the best pockets near CBDs or, you know, on the beach, what's a good alternative? Well, hospital belts to me are one of the best fiscal alternatives when it comes to uh, maintaining a sustainable property for future generations and getting yourself some really incredible capital growth. Uh, I think when it comes to one of the biggest things that uh, really interests me the most, though, is probably the longevity of humans. Um, here in Australia, we already are some of the oldest, uh, you know, we live s- s- lo- a long time compared to many other people around the world. There are certainly many countries around the world where people pass away in their 60s. Uh, it was common here uh, when I was a child, you know, in the seventies, that you know your grandparents tended to pass away in their in their sixties. You know, people didn't live a long time. Now we kind of are living a long time, and it's that quality of life which quite often these reports don't reveal. That you know the the quality of life, though people live a long time, some of that you know, final years of existence, uh, very lonely, very uh, sheltered. Um, A lot of old people are living really, um, you know, urban loneliness. They, uh, here in Australia, we often find that older people are kind of, you know, almost cast aside, which uh, is not a nice thing to do. Um, But we do know if we have a little bit of money in our old years, we can uh, certainly participate in society in many different ways, shapes and forms. So I think uh, what's interesting is, look, the, the current uh, age, which is quite old by world standards, where people pass away um, currently, females sort of 86 years of age, males 82. Males are going to jump up to basically around 90 years of age and females around 92 years of age uh, by, you know, uh, mid-century. So this intergenerational report is really a forecast by government so that they can think about what uh, people will be earning, where the government money needs to be spent, uh, how society will look into the future, and obviously we as property investors can look at the report and go, you know what? I see what's going on here. I see what's happening. We're living forever and there ain't going to be enough people in active jobs to pay for healthcare and the pension. So where is that money coming from? It has to come from somewhere. And again, I think, uh, you know, for me, I can see the writing on the wall. If you don't invest hard, you're going to end up uh, certainly in a place where there's less money to go around. And I don't know what that looks like into the future, but uh, with less skilled workers at the bottom of the Ponzi scheme, then the older people start to suffer because obviously older people don't provide work or potentially older people just going to have to work a lot longer uh, to prop up the whole thing, right? So interesting. I'm learning that the productivity behind my generation or below my generation um, is is going to have to create a lot of output um, because there's going to be a lot longer older people living a much long for a much longer period of time. All right, now here's the kicker for me. This is the one that freaks me out the most. Basically. By 2061, 40 years from now, the average wage, for example, in New South Wales will be $139,000. $139,000 in 19, sorry, in 2061. How bonkers is that? Uh, Today, uh, there are many reports which conclude to live a fairly fun-filled life in uh, 
New South Wales, in many pockets of Australia. You need a real wage today in 2021 of $139,000, not in 2061. And of course, I think this is one of the biggest indicators of really low wage growth, which is occurring in society. That almost it is, uh, we are now 40 years behind really where we should be when it comes to people's take-home income. Really today, the average wage in Australia should be $139,000 so that people can afford their housing, their food, their uh, power, um, their you know uh, travel, their um, recreation, holidays, things like that. And, and certainly that's not the case, right? That is definitely not the case. I even saw that the average ta- uh, taxpayer this was a, a Channel 9 media uh, clickbait thing that was sent to me in an email, but it, it alluded to that, you know, the average average taxpayer paid last financial year, um, you know, they earned basically around 60-odd thousand dollars. And uh, wow, you know, that is not a lot of money to live in a very expensive society, right? So... I think there's some some telltale conversations here that this intergenerational report is absolutely going to, uh, you know, mean that real estate is also going to have to change to accommodate what is occurring. If the fact that the average median uh, wage will be $139,000 40 years from now, and we actually really do need that money now, real estate and certainly what kind of real estate is going to become more valuable into the future is without question something I'm very interested about. And really how real estate is being reshaped uh, is something I'm quite interested in talking about as the reports, you know, they, they don't spell it out for you, but you've got to read between the lines and I'm certainly reading between the lines here. Middle class of Australia is being split in two. That's the first thing I I completely understand from this report. When uh, I've examined, you know, who is making a lot of the high wages today, uh, today there are so many groups earning over $139,000 today in society from engineers to lawyers to the skilled economy, doctors, medical. Um, They're earning today what people will dream about earning in 2061. And so I think it's so important that, you know, we we harness what this information is telling us that there is a group in society today that is is fundamentally 40 or 50 years when it comes to earning capacity ahead of the rest of society. And if we can model where they are particularly buying, then uh, hey, we're gonna we're gonna do well out of our property investments. If we run off to where there is a lot of inequality evolving in Australia, the challenge, of course, is well, will uh, those marketplaces just to continue to grow, even though there is really low incomes uh, compared to the cost of living in those marketplaces. You know, this is this is the battleground. I think the report just spells out the battleground that we can see some critical elements that, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'll call it. It's my own conspiracy theory, but it is what it is. There is no layer of people coming up to prop up the pension system, and uh, without question, I think um, you know you are seeing the split of the middle class. Yeah, you know, the, the fact today that so many people, I think one uh, in four workers or one in five workers today is earning more than what the rest of society will earn by 2061 means I'm interested in that. I want to invest in where that actually is. Now, you can tell, I guess, with particularly... Uh, where we are today in society that, uh, you know, things like uh, cryptocurrencies are quite popular with many people in society because I actually think, you know, one of the reasons crypto is very popular as a uh, 
uh, asset class is it really does allow for people in the almost um, downtrodden pocket of the marketplace to invest. It's very quick. Um, it's very liquid. It's volatile, but that's okay. Uh, that's kind of part of that ecosystem. It can really, you know, I guess, jack up and down quite quickly. And I think for a lot of people, really why crypto is of interest is it is becoming very difficult to play mainstream assets for many people in the economy. It is a lot easier for a 25-year-old to go, you know what, I'm never going to own a property, so why bother even looking into it? I'm going to play in for example, an asset class which is in reach to me. I can buy $400 worth of crypto and talk about it at a barbecue with my friends. Is crypto becoming, you know, the new real estate barbecue conversation? Certainly in my age group, if you go to uh, the coffee shop with your friends, you know, real estate is a bit of a sport in Australia. People love talking about property, how expensive it is, how um, they've done well out of property, what their future property plans are, property, property, property. And really, as this intergenerational dynamic unfolds, you know, will property actually be superseded by, you know, much more liquid real estate uh, or, or uh, you know, things like crypto, right? And I think one of the challenges with real estate is we are going to start to see that the layer um, lower and lower or below the generations that we we currently have are going to wake up in an era where, you know, an average home is $2.53 million. And is it going to be possible for them to play the game? And we're going to talk about where intergenerational markets are headed. Because, you know, what I'm fundamentally explaining to you probably may not even ever impact your decision to own real estate as a property investor. Where I'm going with this is this is the next generation that has to come through. And obviously, as real estate becomes worth more, you know, you need a new generation to come through and, and certainly take it off your hands and want to pay more for it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's this intergenerational conversation, which I'm really fascinated with, because I think it's so easy to go, well, uh, yeah, I'll buy a property. Uh, yeah, I'll buy a cheap property. Uh, and, you know, is there a layer coming through that wants that, um, you know, property asset? This is the question. So I, I certainly think Bitcoin and uh, crypto and things like that really do allow particularly a much younger generational profile to to uh, get to know assets. And I certainly think as many of the younger generation come through as smarter uh, people than potentially the older generation, where skilled jobs were less of a thing, we're certainly going to see people earn more uh, in the right field of excellence. And that's why, you know, I generally go, well, you know, society is being split into this particular side of society is probably never going to play the real estate marketplace. This alternative um, market will. And this sort of leads to the conversation, which is a thing right now, which is known as build to rent, build to rent. Yes. We are now living in an era where large corporations build real estate to rent them out full time to renters. And one could argue we've passed through a period of time where we've gone into a very low rate marketplace. And this is now creating a new marketplace for multinational companies to control the real estate marketplace. And they're going to do that through build to rent. Now, for a very long time, uh, multinational companies, uh, big superannuation funds, uh, pension funds from the US have invested in real estate, typically doing it through REITs, which is basically a real estate investment trust. They typically have 
um, invested in global real estate and that global real estate has typically been commercial real estate and industrial real estate. So some of the largest holdings around Australia are, are sort of held by uh, kind of really old wealthy families or this global corporation of REITs which own shopping centres, they own uh, you know, large industrial parks, they own skyscrapers, they own huge um, manufacturing precincts in countries. And what's so fascinating is the return on investment today, even in industrial and commercial, it's very comparable to residential. Today, uh, if you were to develop your own building and rent it out due to the undersupply of stock, the rents are pretty good. And so these large REITs or uh, large companies, international global mega giants are coming into the Australian property market, New Zealand property market, basically building large buildings where they never sell the real estate, they just rent it out or they create large communities of greenfield and brownfield properties where they never basically sell the real estate. Now, I explain it a little bit along the lines is there the difference between real estate and property is real estate is the title and property is the dwelling. Into the future, to complement where society is going, we are now entering a period where a lot of future generations will basically rent for life. To symbolize this best, really multinational companies are going to absolutely start to put more property into the market, but by doing so, actually creating less real estate. Remember, in New South Wales alone, we need another 1.7 million more dwellings by basically 2061. Uh, To do that, uh, you have to build properties they have to be affordable for people to uh, to to use, right? And as we know, we currently live in a fairly unaffordable state. So if it's unaffordable now, what does affordability look like in 10, 20 or 30 years time? Yes, at the moment, people can flee to Brisbane and to Perth and Adelaide and all these kind of marketplaces. What happens when those marketplaces get more of more expensive. And I think we are going into the golden decade of some of the more new world cities, places like Brisbane and Perth, which are going to become more and more expensive. Really the golden decade of those marketplaces because of their affordability traction. But let's fast forward to 2030 now. Uh, where is the affordability? Where do people go? Well, fundamentally, people don't go anywhere anywhere. What happens is society morphs to a a rent for life society. So this is where you get the split. And my prediction on the split is going to be uh, really well in the 2030s. So 10 years from now, you're really going to start to see uh, people go, well, you know what? I can't afford to own real estate. I'm uh, I'm not a high income earner. I'm, uh, you know, making $60,000, $70,000 a year. I'm going to be a renter for life. And really what is coming through the system with the multinationals is to provide rent for life properties for that marketplace. And it is so interesting to me that this is evolving. And when we look at the 1.7 million more dwellings that are needed, for example, in New South Wales by basically mid-century, what if 50% of those dwellings actually are not technically real estate that go on the marketplace? They are not produced to compete with the owner-occupier market. In other words, we are going to see more property, less real estate. And of course, what that is going to do for anyone that owns real estate is going to push up the value of real estate even further. The value of that real estate is without question going to be appealing to people who today are already earning a really good income. And then the property, there's going to be more property, less real estate, uh, is going to be fundamentally withheld 
by multinational companies and rent it out to people who can least afford, um, you know, to, to ever own real estate. And when you think of it, I always explain, you know, when it comes to understanding this phenomena, build to rent, that, you know, today uh, in distributed urbanism, there's CBDs, there's hospitals, you know, there's manufacturing hubs, there's innovation hubs, there's science hubs all around cities where there's lots of jobs. Let's take the CBD because probably it's the easiest for most people to visualize. The CBD itself, um, if you go to the CBD, is basically corporate office workers, you know, lawyers, smart professionals, knowledge workers, executive assistants, um, people earning today what people hope to earn in 2061. Then you have the sandwich hand and the coffee maker. Uh, How does the sandwich hand expect to get to work and live close to work in 10 years time? This is the the conversation piece, right? Um, And all of a sudden, build to rent comes along and solves a critical problem in future generational real estate. The critical problem is the low income earner is going to have to almost like not live in the city unless the problem is addressed. So build to rent is a really good thing for people who can least afford to get involved in real estate. Will it actually sabotage the broader rental marketplace? Will it soften yields into the future? Well, the challenge which I see inside the development industry these days is those uh, bigger brownfield and greenfield sites where, uh, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, density needs to go. The discerning... I guess, investor marketplace, you know, they're not buying today, you know, an apartment in a block of a thousand, right? So this this marketplace is like, it's it no longer exists in Australian real estate. Yes, uh, people might buy in a medium density complex with a hundred in it as, you know, as a thing. Um, with, you know, beautiful design and, and uh, you know, uh, really good, uh, you know, elements to it. But for the most part, the investor, the owner-occupier, everyone's becoming a little bit more niche when it comes to how they view real estate. So, um, you know, gone are the days where a lot of investors are buying in, you know, a complex where just in that estate itself is – you know, 10,000 properties, right? It, it, it's kind of gone. And so the challenge is for many of the developers that produce real estate for the marketplace to um, have a, an element of supply is there's no depth of market for them to fundamentally sell to locally. In the past, what you have seen to soften the rental market is developers have to take their product to the overseas community. And so they fly up to Beijing, uh, Shanghai. They do a little bit of a tour of places like Jakarta, uh, you know, this sort of Asian and Southeast Asian marketplace. And obviously, pitch real estate, which is really not desired locally. And when I look at the big, uh, you know, reports that come through from Brownfield, and greenfield. Brownfield basically just means like infill and greenfield sort of means, you know, urban sprawl. If you look at the big um, reports of, of both those two genres, uh, you know, there is an element of product which is distributed overseas because locals wouldn't buy it. What it's designed to do is fundamentally make an overseas buyer buy it Um, They buy an inferior property. They're probably never going to make money out of the property. But they provide a rental property to the marketplace. And by providing a rental property to the marketplace, they kind of, uh, you know, help government control affordability of the marketplace. And so one of the challenges as well is, 
you know, a lot of that market is kind of disappeared as well. And, you know, uh, there is a lot of argy bargy hoo-ha at a global level. Australia has a lot of taxes for overseas investors to invest here. And so, again, there's just not enough stock coming through the pipeline. And these big, horrendous, horrible, you know, towers which are produced for overseas investors, you know, uh, are fundamentally drying up. But what we are seeing is build to rent. And build to rent is really this idea that, uh, you know, today a Blackstone, you know, a huge trillion dollar company from America just buys the development site, um, you know, builds 300 homes on it, you know, 200 apartments and creates a community of renters and the real estate never goes to market. It never becomes a a fundamentally a title that investors are competing with. It is a rent for life asset. Blackstone might keep it a hundred years. What they are doing is fundamentally a REIT, an income REIT. So their investors basically share in the proportion of rent collected and uh, that's how it's run. That's basically how it's done. And this is going to be, again, really the next layer of property coming through, which, again, probably makes real estate that people own today even more valuable, knowing that intergenerationally, we are about uh, to see probably 10 years from now, this kind of new space where really, you know, half of society doesn't even inspire aspire to own real estate. I lived in London for a a couple of years in my youth. I worked in a bar, um, the Sun in Splendor on Portobello Road in Notting Hill. Yes, I was actually in Notting Hill when the movie Notting Hill was being made. Yeah. Hugh Grant was cruising around uh, Notting Hill doing his thing with Julia Roberts. I actually watched the movie Notting Hill in the movie cinema at Notting Hill to see the scene inside the movie cinema at Notting Hill. Uh, If that makes no sense to you, if you're a young listener and you've never seen Notting Hill, uh, probably don't even bother watching it. It's uh, it's just a romantic uh, rom-com, probably something you're more acquainted to see in, uh, yeah, you know, the 90s and 2000s as opposed to today. So uh, don't feel like you're missing anything. But uh, where was I? Now I've lost my train of thought. Uh, I lived in Notting Hill and uh, I lived in London for, for, a, for a small period of my life. And what I found so fascinating about London back in that era, you know, t- 25 years ago or whenever it was, 30 years ago, um, probably not that long, 25 years ago, was people in London didn't aspire to own real estate because even back then, generationally speaking, real estate in London was so expensive that really, you know, society had moved past it. They had moved past the point where anyone aspired to own real estate. It was really the idea almost that landlords were were fundamentally lords in London. They were actually lords and, uh, you know, everyone else actually was was not. And obviously, you know, a place like London has a lot more history than than our Australian cities just because it is one of the oldest functioning cities in the in the world and as such you know the price points have have well and truly bolted i think you know what you are going to see here in australia is price points have will bolt to the point where um, you know we're going to start to see a layer of people who are just not skilled enough in their employment dynamic to own real estate. Now go do the maths, go and have a look at a property today, for example, in, you know, a fairly nice pocket of Sydney. If you don't earn $139,000 today, there is no hope of you buying it. The intergenerational report states overall, people will earn $139,000 per annum in 2061. Oh my God. So this is where we're going to have to understand, you know, some of these things that are coming down uh, the freeway and they're just not here yet in full, but they are occurring. And I know plenty of build to rent buildings, which are already underway, um, where basically multinational companies are coming and bought the whole thing and just taking it out in one foul swoop and or are developing a project. Now, again, 
I got to look at this sometimes as a good thing. Now, I know of one project in Melbourne, right? Um, there was 300 apartments in the project. It wasn't a great project. It wasn't something which was going to add value to the real estate marketplace. It was just a, a pretty ordinary 300 um, apartment project. Now, that apartment project, if it came to market as real estate, would have meant there was basically 300 more individual investors and owners owning that three, those 300 properties. They would have at some point wanted to sell those properties potentially. And of course, that creates more supply, which is more interference to the resale marketplace. Now, a large multinational company, a REIT, has come in and taken those 300 properties and that 300, those 300 pieces of real estate will basically never hit the marketplace. So think of it like that. How valuable is that if of the 1.7 million more dwellings required in New South Wales, for example, 50% of those dwellings never hit the real estate market on the resale market from individual investors or owners at all. This is, again, probably a good thing for the property marketplace. Generally, um, it will create an affordable place for people who can least afford it to live in. And uh, I think when it comes to the rental market, again, quality location, quality property, equals quality tenant. So the argument I, I hear a lot around build to rent, well, will someone rent my building um, if there's you know, a build to rent community or will someone rent my home if there's a build to rent community? You've got to think about competition. Competition is going to get thicker in the uh, rental marketplace. Renters are going to be offered better things. And so for me, I always stick to the flight to quality dynamic in the rental market because I am seeing the rental market morph and I need to provide my tenants with a good level of service and housing so that they are in a position to rent off me. Now, I teach there are around 13 different drivers to the rental market. I'll come back and do a podcast on that in the future. I don't have time today. But uh, we need to understand this is something which is well on its way. So we got to compete. We don't want the weird, itchy, cold, uh, mold-ridden um, property. We want something which is modern and at least going to compete. And even if it's older and secondhand, if we can freshen it up and make it more modern, then we're going to compete with um, certainly this typhoon coming towards us. Again, you're probably not seeing this now in 2021, but later in the 20s, I would imagine this is going to be a big talking point. It'll be interesting. I want to uh, see, I want to fast forward right now and, you know, click my fingers uh, and be in 2028 and just see how much build to rent is out there, right? So we're going to come back to this podcast. I'm going to footnote this podcast and I'm going to play it in 2028 and I'm going to see if these predictions are coming true. The next uh, dynamic, which I think you're going to start to see more of into the future of real estate really is along the lines of, I guess, Bitcoin. It is fractional, fractional ownership. Now, fractional ownership kind of already exists in the context that people get together, and do joint ventures and syndications and basically get together, pull their money together, uh, basically 20 people to get together or throw in $100,000, go buy um, a project to do over the short term and try and make money out of it, right? Joint ventures and syndications. But really the idea of fractional is more designed around uh, people pulling their money together, potentially not owning each, knowing each other at all, and fractionally owning some real estate with a pre-organized joint venture arrangement. And this is something even I'm looking into for my clients. Um, there are some companies out there like uh, Bricklet. You basically buy bricks in uh, fractional and 
uh, you know, you trade your bricks. But I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, we haven't seen the best of fractional at this point. It's been a bit of a early pioneering marketplace. Um, you know, do people really want to buy $400 worth of bricks? You know, to me, that doesn't really make sense. Where I see the future of fractional is, you know, people getting fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, twenty five, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, and fractionally owning some real estate with some other people, and uh, doing that as investors, and obviously getting income splits per their contribution to the ownership. I definitely see that happening, um, and it is you know, fairly well already happening. It's something I'm certainly trying to organize for for people inside my group where I know they cannot absolutely afford uh, to have another 30-year home loan on a property. They actually potentially could better be served by going into, um, you know, a fractional playbook. And certainly by 2030, this space is going to be a lot bigger where, Really, um, you know, you, you'll see private enterprise, government, um, and individuals or private individuals, you know, teaming up to buy real estate to get a return from it. And, you know, almost like a REIT where the Blackstones of the world, the big, you know, trillion dollar companies are, you know, doing exactly the same thing, just with uh, a, you know, pooled level of funds from basically, you know, investors, uh, retail investors, you're going to see almost like a private version of REITs through fractional ownership, which basically is just the concept that, you know, five people team up, they all own uh, a share of the property, they all own a share of the debt, they all own a share of the uh, outcome of the asset, and they all own a share of the rent. The only um, real thing is in the past where I think, you know, this asset type, you know, quite often is the liquidity of doing that. And I, that's where I think a fixed term is is a better option for many people. You know, you sign up for 13 years and you're not allowed to get your money out uh, for 13 years. There is no trading inside the fractional dynamic. You're there for the long term, not the short term. And then after 13 years, someone has an option to buy someone else out. Something along those lines, I think, will be very popular into the future. And certainly, I know many people are thinking about that dynamic now where, you know, if uh, into the future, you know, the cost to own real estate is going to be extremely expensive. Do I do it fractionally as a, as a uh, skilled investor through some sort of dynamic around that? So it's very interesting, this intergenerational dynamic. We are definitely seeing our society uh, evolve into the future. And, and these are some of the conversations which you uh, will see into the future, probably more heavily than you do today. Certainly, how I think you should invest today is with future economics in mind. Uh, and for me, that is really investing in really popular locations where people love to live, work and play, suburbs which are really mobile, people can get around, people can get to jobs, uh, suburbs where there's a level of natural amenity, wellness, where people do have a great backyard being the neighborhood as we live more local, and of course, knowledge. I think the idea that the people living in that particular suburb are smart, are skilled, can make a lot of money is really important for the future uh, prosperity of your property investment. Hey, thanks for listening to the Urban Property Investor. If you like the show, feel free, free to leave a review. Uh, if you want to send me some biscuits, drop me a line. I'm open to receiving and eating uh, beautiful Greek biscuits. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time on the Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. 
In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.